Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason. Jason Wong. Ryan is a cow as part of our team. We are SimPoll, uh, a better way to poll. The current state of polling is shit. We are the solution with faster, cheaper, and more accurate polling using SMS technology. The problem is, if you're a current live campaign in San Francisco, you have to hire 30 people in Minnesota to run a live phone bank for you, calling through thousands of voters in the national voter registration list until you get 500 people who are willing to take a 20-minute live phone survey. It costs $30,000 for one poll. It takes a week to get results to turn around. It's only possible in large cities. And it's wrong. People lie to strangers. People lie to strangers. And that's why we get this. So let's demo. Take out your phones for a second and text HI to 415-965-7225. That's HI to 415-965-7225. People at home, you can play along too. This isn't real though, right? It's real. It's real. You really it's want real. me to text that See, right you now? You really want to text it. Text you want it. Me to take text my it. phone out. Text it. This is what you're going to get. We're going to send you a poll question. 7225. You're going to get a poll question. Uh, would you vote for Hillary Caddington or dog no Trump? Reply one to vote for Hillary. Reply two to vote for Trump. Right? We record your answer, and in real time, we analyze the poll results and able to spit it back to you as a campaign. It looks something like this. Right? And it constantly updates every five seconds as we get new results. What is this? This is a text-based polling service that lowers the cost barrier to entry while also increasing accuracy and turnaround speed. Instead of calling people, we text them. Instead of asking them to stay online for 20 minutes to do a phone survey, we allow them to respond in seconds with a direct SMS response. Results? Right there. It's cheap. You can do it for $5,000 instead of $30,000. You can get real-time analysis instead of one-week turnaround. You can operate in niche elections because the rejection rate is lower and there's more people who are willing to take the test, the survey. You're able to operate in school board elections or water board elections in smaller cities. And it's right. People are willing to tell the truth to a machine. They're not willing to tell the truth to a stranger. We are able to use this to develop a deeper bench People in water board and school board elections, candidates that could never afford polling before can afford this. We are able to level the playing field. Third party candidates, green party candidates, libertarian candidates who could not compete against major party candidates can do so with less money with the same data. And we're building smarter campaigns. Major party candidates can do real time polling constantly. You can do more polling for faster, more accurately, allowing you to pivot in the field. We are simple. It's a time for a better way to poll. We'd like to just give you a huge round of applause for, for getting that done in a weekend. Okay, next up, we have here an app that's going to help people organize uh, protests. They're going to help, help people discover and engage in local protests and then also help the organizers connect with the people in that community. To tell you more about it, we've got Liz. Give it up for, what is it? Find, find the fight. Hi, I'm Liz. I represent Find the Fight. The greatest leaps forward in U.S. history are characterized by dedicated direct action. So momentous movements like women's suffrage, civil rights, started as small groups of crazy people who gained notoriety first and legitimacy second. So today, in their earliest stages, today's movements are hindered in two major ways. They're getting from a small group of people with an idea to a march across the nation and translating that participation in the march into constructive action after the fact. With that in mind, we built Find the Fight. It's a mobile forward app to discover and engage in protests, rallies, community events, and more, and to allow organizers to channel those participants into follow-up events and actions. So we have Aileen. Like most people, she's socially connected. She has friends who talk about their activities, political and otherwise, all over the social media. And she sees this tweet from me. I just attended a women's rally. Aileen is passionate about social events. She's excited about women's rights. She wishes she'd heard about this first. So she clicks on the link, and she ends up in Find the Fight. She looks around and discovers that there is a protest for women and allies next week that she didn't even know about. So she looks at the details, decides it's something she wants to be a part of, signs up for notifications, 
she's going to get an email to, tar to register for the notifications. She's going to share it on social so that she doesn't have to go alone and so that people like her will find, about, find out about the event beforehand. And she protests. She stands up to the man in the end. <laughs> yeah, after the event, the organizers email her and they say, thanks for coming, but we need to do more. So she clicks through the email, calls her legislator with our nifty participation from HelloGov, who you'll hear about later. But with this information, they'll be able to determine how many people from the rally actually called their legislator to do some good. If she's not feeling like dealing with email, we'll also send her a text notification instead. Afterwards, because she signed up for this rally, she gets to um, be, hear about other organizations in the area that are doing similar things. So she's going to attend the Women's March in San Francisco. She's going to tell her friends about it. She's going to close the loop that brought her here in the first place. So growing Find the Fight, we can do this by organizing partnerships. Local organizers can load their list and, and more effectively drive post-event action. It also encourages social loops because people want to talk about the cool shit that they get involved with. They also want to not attend rallies by themselves. And we can also scrape and use APIs to pull in event data from all over the internet. So what's next for us? We're looking at dedicated mobile apps with push notifications and text messaging to allow organizers to operate their event in real time. And even future features like point-to-point -point mesh networking that allow the network to stay connected while on the fly. You can help us by connecting us with high-quality progressive organizers, ideally local, and telling us about online resources for event information specifically related to direct action. As this is Find the Fight, join the revolution. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Steph, presenting for the team Populi. Uh, we want to empower our citizens with their consumer behaviors. So uh, we've got two quick questions for you today. Uh, do you know what is politics and how it works? Well, politics uh, is an attempt to answer the qu following question. How do we live together? You know, how do we organize ourselves in the society? Um, so how do we, people think about democracy today? Well, we have this lovely idea where, in principle, you vote and share your intention. Uh, and eventually, policies get passed and to make your life uh, a little bit better. But in reality, your push options are very limited and policies are not necessarily aligning uh, with your values, right? So, for example, you love Gandhi, is strong supporter of guns, but he has zero foresight about when it comes to unemployment. On the other hand, you have uh, the eco-friendly Tasha, but again, she's completely off uh, on healthcare. Both have things that you like or dislike, but you're kind of stuck here. On top of your limited options, your influence is diminished by money, corporation, and lobbyists. There's a lot of money being thrown there, right? So you might wonder, hey, where does this money come from? Well, it comes from you, you, and you, right? Every day, not every four years, but every day you vote. Uh, when you buy this shiny car, when you eat this, your favorite burger, or planning your next trip, to Vegas, right? So today we're hacking uh, this loop and give, giving you the power back to you. All right. All right, everyone. I'm Luke. Uh, this is Populi. We are live and with real data on populi.world. Uh, this is the first screen. What we're asking is what are your political views? What are your values across a broad spectrum of issues? Um, and then you can basically use those sliders click build your profile at the bottom to build your political profile. And you get the companies that match uh, closely with your political views, uh, your possible champions, potentially, um, shows the percentage match next to each company and the breakdown as to why they match with you, what their views are on each issue by percentage. And you can see even expanded view, which shows the bills they lobbied on. You also able to endorse, shame, or promote your champions on social media. So that's the key feature that allows that your uh, voice to be recorded in the system and to select your champion. So in this case, I decide to shame Walmart, didn't match my values, and I can share on social media. 
Same with Tesla, except I decided to endorse them. So revenue model, really free for consumers. We see a huge potential for promote businesses promoting ads, uh, specifically tailored on specific issues. Um, also advocate toolkit, as well as key uh, data insights for institutions and governments. Thank you, thanks everyone, and follow us on at Populi World. You're live, another live product. Populi.world, it's live. It doesn't look like a domain name, but it is. My mom wouldn't know where to type that in. She would just pull up her browser and just stare at it. I don't know where to put this Populi.world, but it's a real URL. All right, next up, we've got Johan with politics. And while he gets set up, Nazir, come join us for a moment. Nazir is uh, one of the organizers here at uh, Debug Politics. He's been really instrumental. If you like our logo or anything about our brand, he's probably had a hand in it. Um, what's been your favorite part of this weekend, Ness? Hi. Uh, thanks for coming, guys um, and girls and whoever else. Um, I think just the energy and the fact that last hackathon we had 12, now we have 17 products. So there's growth there. What is that like? Math is hard. Yeah, math is hard. Um, yeah, for, thank you. I think that's that's what stands out for me. Thanks. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the energy here has been really great. Math, not so much, but um, energy, high. All right, I'll give it up to Johan for politics. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm here to present, uh, so I'm Johan, I'm presenting a project that has been a matter for me for a while, and I'm very glad that you guys organized this as I found uh, mates to push it to the next level. Uh, the name is Politics, the URL is politics.io, and this is how it goes. Um, um, guess what? Citizens want to make informed decisions. It's kind of frustrating that, um, that representatives make decisions that are of hugest impact. But if you talk to people, if I watch myself, I actually don't feel I'm informed in the way I should be. Um, why is that? Because the feedback loop between like a parliament's work and a citizen is pretty much broken. It goes through this channel called news. News are an industry. They are, let's be real, it's entertainment. They have to make money and that's all cool. But it's not useful when it comes to getting it. Uh, on top of your of your information with regards to what's going on in politics, and therefore I believe, and my team believes that if you want to make an informed decision, you really have to focus on the data. There are way too many emotions, way too much fol folklore, way too much tradition in this whole space that you could possibly go with what uh, a pitch of a representative. Like we just learned this with like Donald Trump and all this stuff. So no, 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 let's not, let's not dream. Let's, let's, let's just be real about this. So let's go with the data. And so what politics.io does is essentially we focus on the materialized outcome of uh, parliament's work, which is the legislation. We call it bills. So that's the stuff that actually gets um, adopted into your consti uh, yeah, cons constitution and actually uh, takes effect. And based on those bills, you can, bu you can build a social graph. You can identify which parliamentarians, citizens, and lobbyists are in your sentiment bucket. So ignore the terms, po um, ignore the terms parties, etc. Just focus on who is actually aligned with your sentiment. So let me demo this to you. Um, so if you go politics.io, um, you get like a simple interface and it starts, it asks you to get started with building kind of a profile as just the other guy showed. So it asks you uh, five questions on relevant bills that are currently pro processed. By the way, this is currently implemented for the European Parliament. So those bills are bills that are getting processed in the European Parliament. So the first question is essentially, 
After realizing that some of the biofuels are not as environmentally friendly as anticipated, the Commission proposed to reduce the share in renewable energy to 5% by 2020. Do you like that? Yes, I do. And we have five more cards and a similar matter. So do I like to the sale and import of cloned animals? Nah. Citizens with permanent address should have access to a bank account, definitely. Um, and we submit essentially this like seed data to our backend uh, query, the social graph, and identify the three representatives and the three lobbyists that are most aligned with your opinion. Um, with this result, you can now go further. You can become a clicktivist. You can you kind of know now what your actual opinion is, and you can now actually push your agenda, guys. So you can now make decisions that are way more profound as any decisions you made on this before. So you can learn about those representatives, you can learn about the lobbyists, you can share it on your social media channels, etc. Um, yeah, I think that's my demo. The team was... Uh, so I had like one product manager that helps me yesterday, Mark, he could, can't be here today. I'm the engineer, and then Marcos helped me remotely a little bit with his styles, and I have a team of uh, political scientists in Brussels that help me scrape the data and make the data readable, because legislation is hard to read, right? <laughs> okay, that's it, thanks. Hey guys, I'm Thomas. Um, and this last election season, I was going to register for my absentee ballot, and I found the process to be pretty horrifying. Uh, I'll walk you through it a little bit. I had to uh, print out a form. I don't have a printer. I had to go find a printer. I had to go find an envelope. I don't mail things. The last person I mailed before this, I think, was my grandma, and that's because she doesn't know what email is yet. Um, and then I also had to go to the post office to mail it. Uh, all in all, I think it took me about 30 minutes, and the average wait in some, uh, I think, voting was like five minutes. So I really wanted to speed up that process. Uh, also, if you go to wait in line to vote, uh, you're wasting your time when you could be doing other things. It was found that about half a billion was lost in worker productivity in 2012 to people waiting in line to vote. So I want to help eliminate that with Easy Absentee, which is your one-stop absentee registration for just a couple of bucks. So how's it work? So you come to our site, you fill out the simple form with all of your info, we package and ship your application, and then all this happens for only two bucks. You don't have to go to the post office, you don't have to go buy an envelope, we do it all for you. So I'm gonna walk through a quick demo. Uh, I recorded this earlier because I didn't wanna be up here typing. Um, so here's what you do. Same form that you would fill out if you went to your government website, pretty much. Um, See if I can speed this up a little bit. All right, so yeah, you come here, fill this out. Uh, you view your application. If it looks good, you sign it. Um, I trust you guys, so don't steal this. Um, and there you go. You have now registered to vote for your absentee ballot and uh, yeah, now you can, uh, you know, share your voice and get out and vote. So, yeah, thanks to my team, and we're easy absentee. Uh, go out and vote. Thanks. Nice job. Hi there. So we are three software developers. Uh, we have uh, Miguel Carranza is up there in Mission Control. Say hi. Running uh, the live stream up there, Miguel. Yeah, giving us the, uh, the good stuff. Uh, Tonio Moreto is standing here next to me, and I, Alfonso Perez. And we are bullshit meter. All right, so although it's getting increasingly more difficult in some sense, maybe, um, um, to deceive that and to like, spread news to the public, uh, well, sometimes it still happens. And when it does, the consequences are terrible, right? So for example, we, we, we all know the, the, this example of this fake news article that came out um, about uh, this FBI agent suspecting Hillary uh, found that, um, Hillary investigation found that in his house. And although this was quickly debunked, uh, so- She's okay? She's, she's okay, Hillary? She, she made it out okay? I <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so so yeah, the, the the information was already out there and the damage was done, and so we've come up with a tool um, that aims to partially solve this problem by acting as a shield for online bullshit, right? So this is actually, a, by the way, a fully functional product. We we got together on Friday and uh, we just uh, didn't sleep yesterday <laughs> a little bit, but. Uh, so we're creating this index of a uh, news article categorized by the percentage of bullshit there is within them. Um, and then uh, we're populating that index um, with this Chrome extension that you can download and install. And with your expertise and informed decision, you could help um, other people um, to decide or to see if oh, the percent of bullshit that is within a news article. So, all right, yeah, so... Oh, we well, just, gonna just see glossed it. over that slide there real quick. Yeah, well, <laughs> this maybe. This so we're going to see how this works in, in practice, right? So let's see, I'm, I'm surfing the internet, right? So I see this news article, and um, I click on my, I've got a lot of extensions already. All right, so I just uh, have to reload. Yeah, this one that works. Do we have internet? We have internet? Yeah. All right, so just by the way, just doing it, all right? So there's already... Two boats, so it's 75% bullshit. And I'm just gonna connect my computer. That's all right. All right. Bullshit! Uh, all right. So, yeah, we'll just keep uh, scrolling. Uh, by the way, we're uh, already implementing authentication methods, and our, um, so right now it's integrated with Google Auth, and uh, we're still in the works of uh, measuring the votes a little more clever and by using a bunch of different algorithms, so this information is uh, a bit more meaningful. And also, we're collecting a, a bunch of different metadata for these articles. So, um, about these articles, sorry. Um, so this gives us enormous um, possibilities. So that's why we are not only open source, of course, but we are releasing a public API so you guys can access it and try to make the web a little bit, bit more true. Uh, so we're excited so what you guys can cook up with this. And um, so uh, that's our Twitter handle. So if, if you guys have any ideas or how we could improve, just uh, ping us. and. Thank you for your attention. Woo! All right, next up, fighting voter suppression, voter aid. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Matt. This is Helen. Woo! Our whole crew is, is out there scattered. We'll, we'll introduce him later. Uh, and we are voter aid. A um, couple things. Voter suppression is rampant. It's, and as, as much as I think we may be protected from it or we feel like, it's happening everywhere in the United States. And um, this is a, a direct... Uh, it's a direct denial of our civil rights. The 15th Amendment protects everyone in this country to have the right to vote regardless of race, creed, color, et cetera, et cetera. Voting Rights Act, most significant piece of legislation in America's history, arguably, in many ways. Um, right now, there's really nobody that's tried to track voter suppression. So we know it happens, but we don't know where it's happening and at what point. A lot of times it's reported after the fact. So we're not able to solve it at the point of, of incident. Um, and because there's not a lot of stats around how it's directly, what's actually happening. But we do know there are a few things that are taking place. There was a, a one uh, quote that you mentioned that half a million dollars, in pro, or half a billion dollars lost in productivity, standing in line, voter ID issues, um, precincts having to, to scrap votes. And there's so many different forms of this happening. Um, this is just a very, very small list of ways that voters are not able to vote at the polls in the way that they're allowed to. Um, so Helen's gonna go through the solution. So our solution is to stop voter suppression at the source. Um, we want to register on the ground responders during election day, um, have an immediate response to voter incidences of voter suppression, and inform users, or voters, <laughs> about their rights. Uh, we also want to raise awareness of voter suppression um, by mapping each of these reported incidences. Uh, we want to measure the impact and then analyze the re reported incidences to inform policy. Um, so how does it work? Voters text voter aid um, to a number. We don't want to expose it right now because it's someone's number. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, voter aid helps voters understand their, their legal rights by an automated responses. And then in instances where that needs to be elevated to a real person, we have uh, what we call responders helping. Um, so, and we also offer multi-language support because one method of voter suppression is unequal access. Um, so what a responder is, a responder is a volunteer who helps voters understand what's legal and what's not. 
Um, and they are not bound by the same restrictive laws that poll watchers or observers or challengers, depending on what state you live in, what they might be called. Um, they're, uh, they're not bound by the same restrictive laws that poll watchers are. Um, so for an instance, in Michigan, uh, the number of poll watchers that you can have per precinct is only two. And uh, there are restrictions over who is eligible to become a poll watcher. So uh, this opens it up to far more volunteers. Um, because uh, responders are essentially just clarifying the law instead of um, challenging the law. So this is our demo. Wow, you, it's a little bit bleached out on the screen. <laughs> um, but essentially, a uh, voter is texting voter aid. So they get an automated response asking where the address that they're registered to vote is. This helps us map their location. Um, so then they are also asked to text number of the corresponding problem that they're facing. So in this case, they can't find their polling location. Um, it's a little bit slow. So they can't find where the library entrance is to their polling location. And so we are connecting them with the responder. Um, and then the responder interface looks like this. Essentially, someone registers online to become a responder, and we text them um, saying someone needs their help. Um, if they're able to respond, they, they reply yes. And then we, we send the responder's contact info to the voter. And yeah, so this is also, we also have a registration form that's live. It's a little janky at the moment. <laughs> But it's everything you need is there. But you had a whole weekend. I don't understand. <laughs> Do we not have enough coffee? That's what I'm getting. <laughs> Definitely it not must enough have been coffee. the coffee. Uh, and this is our team. Yeah. yeah. It's all open source. We want people to continue to work on it. It's under the MIT open source license. Uh, you can go to github.com slash voter dash aid slash voter aid. Check out the repo. We have a list of issues. Uh, and wish lists that we want to have for new features to be um, opened up and worked on. Thank you. Well, according to former congressional staffers, there's really two effective ways to really get your politicians' uh, attention. One is, of course, is to call them. Two is something we probably here in the room haven't done very much, which is actually to show up at their meetings where they are and voice your opinion. Now, the, the problem is this, though. It's been very difficult to find out where these uh, events are happening and where these meetings are taking place. And even if you do find them and search on the internet and you find their calendar of events, it's very complicated to, you know, uh, time consuming to add that particular meeting or event to your calendar. So the solution? Our team, Show Up, has built a very simple web app that allows you to instantly add and subscribe to those public calendars and add it to your Google Calendar. So this is live right now. Uh, go to showapp.me if you have internet access right now. Pull it up, and I will do a live demo in real time. This is just a mock demo, right? No, real. There's no way. You only had a weekend. Yes. What happens? <laughs> you click the button, and we'll show you the relevant calendars in San Francisco. So for example, we want to uh, add the Muni calendar. Hit the Add to Google Calendar button. And then you would then be asked to verify which calendar you want to add it to. Here, we'll do this one. And then, of course, you allow our app to access your calendars. And then instantly, your calendar is added. What, what does that mean? Look at the calendar right here. Boom, on the bottom, right here, you'll see San Francisco Muni calendar right here. Oops, sorry, highlighted right there. That's a task force calendar what? in real time. How did you do okay? that? Yeah. Woo. All right. So that's Show Me. Um, let me get back to the presentation. So that's the app. So we encourage you to, of course, go to uh, our current live site, add those calendars that you're interested in. And then, of course, uh, we'll, you know, if you're interested in this particular project, our entire GitHub code is up there. Um, you know, this is only currently done for San Francisco. So if you're interested in helping out uh, for other areas, Definitely do that, okay? And that is 
that's show that's show up so so the we vote team is an ongoing team uh, project that's been building code for about 14 months we have 23 github contributors and over 70 volunteers who've helped over that time so it's been a lot of fun we had a team of six here so we are a social voter guide you could follow us at twitter we vote and what we decided to do at Debug Politics SF2 is to focus on one area of our product that needed some design user flow built out. So what we focused on was the, the task of creating and sharing a voter guide with a Twitter sign-in. So we used the Google Ventures inspired design sprint methodology. Very fun. Search, check it out. It's pretty, pretty well done. And came up with this. So we start with we, the we vote site at wevote.us has over 10 has tens of thousands of candidate and measure uh, items in the database and so what we did was we started from one of them which is the california prop 59 and we said well when do we want to introduce the concept of creating your own voter guides we started with well let's let's imagine someone supports that and then adds a comment and at that point, we want to ask them, are you interested in learning more about creating your own voter guide? There will be a number of other places in the site where I think we can feed people into the voter, starting, uh, the voter guide creation process as well. So, so as part of the onboarding, we looked at, at what are the reasons why people would create voter guides to educate others. And we all have friends in our networks who are creating these voter guides and sharing them on Google spreadsheets and docs. So our hope is that Wevo will provide that. Um, as well. So letting yourself be seen, letting your opinions be seen. There's tens, we, we imagine there's tens of thousands of organizations across America that create voter guides and um, are interested in distributing those. And then finally getting feedback, whether it be friends commenting on your, your voting op opinions or, or um, wanting to just see the number of visitors. So we go to the sign-in process. Working with Twitter has given us a ton of information, ranging from photos to background images to, to demographic information. Um, also, upon signing in, we, we envision being able to auto-follow all of the other voter guides attached to Twitter handles of the people that you're following. So when you get into your, your ballot, you can see all, the, all of the voter guides um, of people you're already following. So. There's a number of ways you can find items to add to your voter guide, whether it be by, lo by, lo by location or by searching. And let's just say we choose that one. And then we're dropped back into the, um, the, uh, an existing voter guide where you can actually um, see what opinions you're, you're sharing either with your friends or publicly. So we're, we have open engineering and design internships. We're all, always recruiting volunteers. We're, we're at Code for San Francisco every Wednesday night. Very thankful for Code for America for, for hosting. And um, if you're interested, check out wevote.us. And um, our GitHub is, as you guessed, we want to help you out with influencing new government regulations. Uh, something, it's something that not a lot of people know about. Who here in this room has actually visited the Federal Register before or even knows what it is? Just raise your hands. The what? Wow, like almost five people? Oh, that's pretty good. So it turns out that if you want to influence new regulations, the thing you do is you submit policy comments on the US Federal Register. And what happens is the federal government is required to respond to some of those comments. It depends if you actually say something relevant. But basically, this ends up like actually having an impact and preventing agencies from making all sorts of mistakes. When I first found out about this, I like got a bunch of people together and like started doing research to try to submit comments but it turns out like the doing research part seemed a bit easier than like finding things to comment on properly so like their website is okay but when you go to it and you like sort through a category you'll just find like tons of irrelevant like not very significant policies for every like significant policy and if you like even if you find something relevant and there's like a lot of people commenting on it you'll like just find oceans of spam and like be have a very hard time manually clicking through PDFs one by one looking for like decent comments with analysis you can build off of. So our goal with Regulately is to make it easy to find the most relevant policy to you. So how do we do that? This is what our homepage looks like. You can filter the open policies 
um, by category. You can see how many people have already commented. Are other people interested in this? You can see the engagement, so we're doing some calculations of how many people have commented recently. And you can use all of these things to find the policies that you actually want to learn more about. When you go into that, uh, we've made it easier for you to participate. So we're highlighting more relevant policy information than you can find on the regulations.gov website. We've used the Watson text processing API to give you a sense of the sentiment of the existing comments. How are other people feeling about this policy? Is it very controversial? Do people feel positive or negative? You can view other people's comments, and one of the problems we've seen a lot is uh, hundreds or thousands of spam comments on large regulations, so we wanted to give a different way for you to show that you feel the same thing as someone else, which is upvoting and downvoting, so we've just added that. And if you've read through other people's comments, you feel inspired, we have a link to let you go participate directly on the regulations.gov website. So, new features. As Tessa just said, we just added the upvoting. Um, keep clicking. <laughs> so another thing that would be useful that we're looking forward to adding is like sorting comments by complexity. Uh, oftentimes, like the spammy comments are rather short unless it's just a form letter, and the rather like longer, detailed, more nuanced comments are like a bit longer. Um, there's also like additional fields that are in the API submitted by regulations.gov, which like include things like will this have an economic impact greater than $100 million? Being able to actually search by stuff like that means you can actually find things that are relevant. So you can also like analyze how impactful comments have been in the past when you have so many submitted through a common system and see like what sort of things correlate with success in impacting regulation. And lastly, we could do some optical character recognition in order to better sort through some of the PDFs that people submit. So please check out our live demo at regulately.us. We've got it all on GitHub like many of the other teams. We'd love for you to contribute. We're just starting to upload our issues now. So please help us help you make your voice heard when it comes to new government policies. Thank you. Nate Silver was wrong, and the pollsters now all recognize that the landline polls missed a very important part of the U.S., which is low-income people. And the statistics show that the majority of low-income people do not have landlines, so they are not answering any of those polls. Ah, thanks. There we go. Thank you. SMS text polling is affordable, faster, cheaper, and they reach low-income people. We know this because we've been doing SMS polling for over two years. We are a nonprofit um, called Citizen Insights. We work on providing on-demand insights for policymakers from low-income people. Um, we've had traction. We've done polling around is issues around education, healthcare access, worker access. Our revenues are growing, are doubling um, every year, and we have the currently the largest panel of low-income participants in California. Now our vision is we have so far been a services nonprofit, so we do polls one by one. What we want to create is a platform with technology behind it that will enable us to scale to one million participants to be a platform with open source data about motivations, perceptions, desires, and insights from low income people throughout the United States. So what we've done this weekend, we're trying to build this platform that will accommodate one million participants. So, basically in the past what was going on was a lot of Excel magic. <laughs> so we wanted to try to get away from that. So basically what we did was we created a front end that uh, pulls from a database, and this database has been populated with all the, or the, the data that she's collected o over the years. And what that allows her to do is, is that she is able to select different questions and select these different fields and then submit a query and then it spits back out all the um, all the phone numbers that that had those responses. So what's great is that if let's say you ask someone you know these particular questions, are you looking for a new job? You know, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, yes, and and you found out about it uh, via website. And um, how do you feel about you know finding local jobs and, and job training? And you think it's hard? You can dig deeper down into these into these groups and ask them more questions and see like you know what is it? You know what would be helpful for you? Is, would you want like a local number that you can call? Would you want a local office that you can go to? Um, and and yeah, like we, we put together the API and we got the front end put together, and we were hoping to actually submit it uh, to the Textit API as well. And what's great is that the Textit API allows us to uh, generate very complex uh, text message based surveys, and that's what allows us to. Uh, make ourselves accessible to these low-income participants. And beyond that, it's beyond just the U.S. I mean, the, the world, there's a lot of people 
in the world who only have SMS available. Thank you. We also um, want to show that you can add this SMS polling data to other open data sources. So um, transforming the SMS polling data with Ruby and Python, you can create something like this. And this is looking at low-income people in Santa Clara County and seeing if they are happy with the quality of their drinking water. And it's overlaid with open data sources of who to contact, um, their local re politician. And the yellow areas are places where there's a high concentration of low-income people who said that they did not think the quality of their water was good. So on the scalability side, we have a plan for scaling. Um, how do we get more low-income people to participate and get their voices heard? On the demand side, we have a number of uh, foundations, nonprofits, um, other revenue sources to pay for these types of opinion surveys. Um, and here's our team. So, All right. So there's two really big problems with volunteering. Um, the first problem is from the volunteer side. It's really hard for a volunteer to know how much impact they're making in the community. Um, or if they're volunteering for a political campaign, how many voters they're actually turning out, how many political contributions that equals. Um, the second part is actually really hard for the organizers. They don't know how, they don't have enough data to keep track of their volunteers. They don't know uh, to look at demographic trends um, with their volunteers. They don't know how to service that data. Um, to uh, recruit more volunteers uh, for their projects. So that was kind of our, our idea, essentially. We wanted to, uh, wait, go back. Um, so volunteers are, and con contributions to uh, get out the vote campaigns and other events are extremely valuable. But we don't know how valuable they are. Um, so we wanted to answer that question. We wanted to collect data to visualize exactly how much uh, your impact was when you volunteered to, to a political campaign or a nonprofit organization was in dollars, in the dollar amount value. So for every hour you you volunteered, how much does that equal in political expenditures to that campaign or political contributions from a lobbyist group? Um, so we did some uh, data analysis uh, of a uh, surveys of voter participation, campaign expenditures, and just overall figures for voter turnout, and we calculated the estimate value of each volunteer hour is $16.67. Um, now, uh, that's extremely important because then at that point we can, uh, we know how much, how many hours, or what the dollar amount value is for a voter participating in uh, a political election. So the stack we use is we just use R to analyze the data and, and construct that initial metric. Um, we built our app on top of Rails, and then we surfaced the data uh, and visualized it using Looker um, on top of a MySQL uh, database. You're just throwing out buzzwords we, now. Yeah, that's, that's all we're doing. <laughs> um, OK. That's and Kevin's going to talk about uh, the prototype. Awesome. Hi. So I'm going to try and demo the prototype really quick. Um, so we have this nice little web page kind of served up. Um, so say I want to log in. Um, we already pre-populated someone, Kenny, uh, with some volunteer data, and he's been to a couple events. Uh, it's the password. This looks really good for one weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Look at that loader. Holy shit. Oh, oh. pre-made pre -made things are really nice. Um, unfortunately, we like kind of stuffed in a lot of like spoofed data, so the database is taking long, but we planned ahead of this. So. This is what the login page eventually looks like when you get <laughs> oh, to it. Man, that's good. <laughs> and so from Looker, we surfaced this oh, data. Wow. And based on the calculations we made, uh, Kenny has contributed about $1,600. Um, and then we have some more data based off that. But the real question is, how do we get that data to become, um, how do we get volunteers to use this application and make it verifiable? So the real idea is that we take a uh, geo, geo point. Um, so when people check in to say, like, Honk and wave for Bernie Sanders. Um, we take a geopoint for the event, and then we create a geofence around that uh, event um, area. And then based on that, we make sure that they're still in the event and still contributing, still volunteering. And that's how we take the data. Yeah, awesome. Cool. All right, thanks, guys. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we are Spectrum. Um, we have some remote people here as well. Um, so Spectrum, um, as uh, Avon introduced, is a um, originated as a Chrome extension that is designed to surface up um, news media, news results uh, from the other side of the political spectrum from what you're generally used to reading. Um, the major problem that we're trying to solve is that, you know, we're, uh, as many of us realize, the day after election day, uh, 
many of our media sources end up reinforcing rather than solving our country's polarization. And we're living in probably one of the most polarized times of our country or any country uh, in modern uh, history at this point. Um, our solution to that is trying to learn to speak the, uh, the language of our fellow Americans, uh, speak the language of the other side um, of the political spectrum here by reading what they read, listening to what they listen to, and so on. Um, Spectrum does that by uh, addressing um, media bias in sources that you're reading by surfacing up the bias in this little modal here, fake news, filter bubbles, and our incomprehension of the other side. This is the presentation down here, so I'll show you guys um, a little demo of what that looks like. Uh, don't need me there. There's going to be a little voice in this case, that sounds like me. Oh, okay. I actually don't need that, so let me... Uh, Okay, cool. So as you can see, we have the, a little modal presentation that shows you the actual publication bias of what you're reading. Um, you can't really see it too well, but there is uh, the text of the title and the two, um, uh, two sources from the other side of the political spectrum from the one you're reading. In the first case, we had Fortune Magazine, which was a uh, left of center, or right of center publication, and it's recommending uh, Washington Post uh, as an alternative to that. Uh, on the same topic area. So that was the initial version of it. What we built this weekend was a, um, a mobile version of the same thing. So this is a Safari app extension um, that surfaces up as you're browsing uh, Safari news articles. You know, many people end up reading news on their mobile device as opposed to um, their desktop. So this ends up um, extending Spectrum into uh, another platform here. A uh, big part of our work this weekend has actually been more trying to turn what we have into something that's real instead of kind of demoable stuff. Uh, so a lot of our work has been sort of putting together um, models for the uh, actual associations between different articles, um, trying to highlight, uh, you know, different um, uh, connections between articles in, uh, on one platform or one media source uh, to other ones. Uh, so there's been a lot of sort of machine learning stuff, back-end work and so on. Uh, by no means complete at this point. We're still working on a lot of those details, but um, so there's nothing sort of too robust to show you guys. But um, we are uh, plugging away with a lot of that stuff and uh, very much interested in um, uh, getting people who are news savvy individuals, people who like reading the news, to um, support us in uh, as we begin our beta launch in the next few days or weeks. Um, to help us out by reading some of uh, the articles that we're surfacing up and kind of telling us, you know, does this look right, does this not look right. So if you are interested in helping us out with that, we can definitely use your help. Um, and otherwise, you know, uh, also looking for machine learning people and uh, media experts as well. So thank you guys. Okay, uh, hello, <clears throat> welcome. My name is Florin. I moved two months ago. I mixed up my credit card and I decided to move to the US. You got to eat and the mic. Put it right there. I'm you go. trying, but ah, okay. There it is. So yeah, three months ago I uh, decided to move from the uh, from Europe to here. Maybe less propaganda, but I'm here and fake news is still a problem. So <laughs> uh, what I did uh, was. Uh, I, I took a, a batch of 35 pages that usually post fake news like Brady that was earlier uh, on somebody's slides and uh, scraping around uh, 5,000 posts each hour. The idea is to detect the ones that are uh, getting viral. Uh, this is how all of the posts that uh, I have now in the database in the last 10 days looks. And we see that there are a lot, a lot of uh, different uh, posts, but we are interested only in the ones that are making a lot of damage like this one that it has one, over 100,000 shares. This uh, was the one that will influence the people the most. <coughs> so this is the problem. And uh, another problem is that uh, you find out about uh, uh, this information and uh, until you debunk it, uh, the, real, the fake story is gonna be much more visible. For example, this story had 32,000 K, but uh, then uh, the Snoops did a counter-argument the next day and it, and they had like 500 shares. Uh, this is uh, one of the scripts uh, detected by uh, the algorithm. And it, this was in the first hour, it had like 200 uh, shares. And in the second hour, it already had almost 2,000 shares. Based on the exponential growth and other uh, filtering algorithm, we are able to detect uh, this uh, 
information that we can then send to journalists that they can uh, do fact checking. So instead of checking 1,000 articles each day, they can only check 10, 20 articles and see if they are true or not. And this is the Snoops article when they did it already almost 80% of all of the shares for the fake article were already gone. Uh, usually on Facebook everything is about speed. If you try later, you will done. It's pointless kind of to do something the next day. Okay, I don't have a front end, so I will try a demo. Uh, ah, and I didn't expect to have it. Okay, let's see. So basically, what it's doing now is querying all of the data and, ah, oh, perfect. And it's outputting uh, just the ones that uh, are uh, getting viral. And we can see the text information, the number of share and different things that are not visible here. But we have a Google uh, spreadsheet. This was the only thing that I was able to do. Uh, we have a Google spreadsheet with, uh, and I will post the link. Designers needed. <laughs> yeah. And uh, here it's outputting each hour uh, all of the new articles, and you can uh, go to the link and see, like this, we can see it has 4,000, and now it's, okay, it's loading too slow to show, but we can see that it's, now it's 4,500, and it's gonna grow more and more. Uh, okay, and. You yeah. got all that? Everyone got that? Uh, yeah. Just the last slide. Yeah, easy show. stuff. Okay, so I'm searching uh, uh, also for uh, if somebody have Amazon credits or stuff like that because I want to scale it more, but I need uh, better infrastructure. Also better tester if you know journalist or if you try to want to test the tool. You have my email contacts and I'm around here. Thanks. Nice job. <laughs> All right, well, um, while we, the next presenter gets set up, um, Andrew, do you want to come up for a second? Um, this event requires a lot of help um, and a lot of people that care a lot about what we're working on and are willing to put in time. But um, I think we went to Chipotle to try to get pick up and, and pay with uh, you know care, and that didn't work so well. So um, Andrew, what can you tell us about what really is making this possible, uh, the other 50%. Yeah, um, hi, I'm Andrew. It's money is the answer, uh, believe it or not. Yeah, so um, we're, you know, these, these events are pretty expensive. We have awesome uh, folks like GitHub and our last event, 500 Startups, that are giving us our, their space, which is phenomenal. Um, but we also have to continually uh, bring in more, more money to run these events. So um, we accept sponsors, as you can tell, obviously, and also donations. Please email hello at debugpolitics.com if you're interested, and I will tell you all the amazing reasons why you should give us your money. Yeah, that's it. Nice. What we wanted to tackle was the lack of engagement in local news. What we noticed is that News is going down in engagement viewership. We're seeing in, over the last 10 years a decrease of 25% in local news viewership. To compound this problem, we're also seeing a lot of shows like uh, John Stewart's show, Last Week Tonight, the Seth Meyers show. They're replacing what news is for us. So what that means is that these shows that are focused on New York City, that are focused on Los Angeles, that are focused on DC, are kind of watering down the voice of other cities like Houston and Detroit. And we wanted to give them a voice. So we built out a platform to enable you to create content that's distributed to a national audience. The difference between this and YouTube is that this content is curated and site checked, meaning that all the content on here is going to be factually correct and it's going to be entertaining. So as you can see on the front page, we've got content that we've actually produced along with the articles that led to us creating the content. Then below that, we have content from who theoretically would be partners who also create content for you to delve deeper into the issues that you care about. And as kind of a proof of concept to show how this could work, we produced a video for less than $100 that we think is actually pretty entertaining. So without any further ado, Can 
shits in the hardest hit areas. Just the AV? AV? AV up in the nest. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, just do option click on the on the volume. Just go for it. Oh, we got feedback. Yeah, it's really easy. Just this is your local late night. Heavy rain battered the Bay Area this weekend, dumping an unbelievable three inches in the hardest hit areas. This storm apocalypse resulted in multiple car crashes, power outages, and Sarah complaining about Uber surge pricing. pg <laughs> e later released a statement on the positive environmental impact of continuing to leave more than 3,000 Bay Area homes still without power. In other news, SantaCon turned 22 this week. SantaCon, short for Santa Convention, is not, in fact, a meetup of multiple Santas across parallel universes <laughs> gathering to discuss the latest improvements in sleigh technology, elven worker management techniques, and chimney sliding lubricant. No, instead, it is branded as a pub crawl slash toy drive, but it is actually something far more ridiculous. It combines a couple of San Francisco's favorite activities and worst qualities, wading through huge crowds of people with no justifiable reason for gathering and believing with all of our hearts that we are still, in fact, 22 and in college. It's a holiday for people that want to relive those whimsical college years with a $5 cent outfit and some good old-fashioned binge drinking. And as we all know, we definitely can relive those college days and do it well into our 30s. The experience will be all the more improved by dressing like Kris Kringle and making out with a stranger wearing a fake beard. From local late night San Francisco, this is Eric O'Donnell. I'm off to don my Santa hat and vomit in an alley. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> I would like to give a big thank you to our production team. We actually had a director, an actor, and a scriptwriter come in to do this. On, in addition to that, our dev team kicked ass and you know what's crazy about that? They're only 16 years old. So give a big round of applause for everybody that helped this. <laughs> Woo! Newshound, another fake news uh, fighter here, detecting fake news and providing facts along the way. Give it up. Um, Eat the mic. In, I do it in one of two ways. Eat I it. either Google it. <laughs> um, I either Google it and I find the source. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. Sorry. You gotta turn it on first. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Small things. Hey guys. Woo. Okay, so I'm a journalist and this is how I consume news. I either find it in my browser and I pull up the site. Unfortunately, a lot of websites are now imposters and um, they spread fake news, which ends up in your Facebook feed. Um, how do you debunk this news? Well, you could go to a fact-checking website, but who has time to sit there and debunk every single story that your crazy Aunt Sally posted? So this way, uh, fake news becomes viral. It's a wildfire and a virus. So speaking of virus, this is kind of a weird looking map, but what it shows is actually a map of how fake news spreads through social media. And this was commissioned by Facebook. In 2014, they discovered that each of those blue dots is a touch point for a user that actually shared the fake news. And the red dots are when somebody refuted it with actual fact checked information. And what they discovered is actually the red dots really stop the spread of fake news. It goes less viral and there's actually a 440% increase in the chance that the person who originally posted it will delete it. So we created NewsHound. It's a browser extension, much like you've heard about tonight, and it does a couple of things. First, it sniffs out the most egregious offenders of fake news, the worst of the worst, the spam. Then it identifies those for our users directly in line in Facebook and when you're browsing on the web. Then it also takes the trove of existing fact check information that people have spent years of their lives devoted to printing and writing and handcuffs it directly to the fake news itself so that when fake news goes viral, so does the truth. How's it going, folks? My name is Ryan. This is Jeremy. We're two of the engineers on the project. I'd like to say for the 100th time tonight, fake news. <laughs> People are interested in this, right? So let's, let's begin our journey uh, with a potentially dangerous journey to Facebook. 
right? And before we dive into our uh, Facebook news feed, that looks real to me. Let's equip uh, ourselves with the browser extension that will help us dissect what's going on on our news feed. So uh, I've got this new friend named Ryan who's just recently started posting on my wall. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd see whether NewsHound uh, helps me out here. So I've got their standard algorithms going. And, oh, yeah, this looks like this could be a problem. But, oh, my, this is red. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why this is a problem. <laughs> so our approach to identifying fake news online is two steps. The first is an automated system that analyzes the source of the news. This system asks questions like, is the website less than six months old? Is the website operated by a single person or an organization? Answering these questions helps us identify some of the most egregious news and some of the worst purveyors of fake news online. All right, so NewsHound's algorithms are pretty clever, but let's see uh, if there's more to the story. Uh, let me go ahead and see if Snopes has anything more to say. Cool, so as Jeremy was pointing out, uh, we have several pieces to this puzzle that again help us identify fake news. Previously, we just had our uh, automatic system, which gave this story a score of 21 out of 100. He recently enabled the uh, Snopes fact-checking channel, which adds additional layers of scrutiny to news on our, uh, on our news feed. So what we use here is information or, or uh, online refutations by fact checkers of viral ideas. So if I work at Snopes and I publish a rebuttal to the idea that the Pope endorsed Donald Trump, if I publish that once, then we use a natural language processor to look at the articles that are shared on your Facebook feed and we ask, is this article about that idea? And no matter where the article is published, no matter who writes about it and where it gets shared, we can track it and we can share with you the fact checked resource. All right, so it looks like uh, Snopes had more to say. This is having an even lower rating. Let's see what they had to say. Oh, it looks like uh, <coughs> their address is the Web Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, <laughs> and Obama apparently never uh, banned the pledge. Um, anyway, we can actually dig in a little deeper, see more specifically what Snopes had to say about it. And, uh, and here's the article that, that references this, this particular article. Um, in addition to that, I'm like, well, okay, it's great. I know this is fake, but I think, I think Ryan needs to know that it's fake. So we've kind of made it really convenient for you to go ahead and copy the content and just go ahead and uh, hassle him back. <laughs> and now, and now, <laughs> boom, Ryan's better informed and the world That's is awesome. better for it. This, thank you, thank you. This last part I really want to highlight because everything we've seen so far makes it easier for me, the person that has this extension, to be better informed and to consume news in a more intelligent manner. But the ability to share this information with my network is what actually helps us stop the spread of the virus. As Quinn mentioned earlier, posting the refutation to these viral lies helps more than any other factor in stopping the spread of fake news. So we are live at getnewshound.com. Uh, check us out in the Chrome Web Store, and I would just like to end by saying a big thank you to our entire team that helped made this possible. Last, but certainly not least, is a company called HelloGov, and they were here in our last uh, hackathon. They presented a really great idea, and this week, I'm this weekend, I'm very excited that they pivoted on that idea and took it to the next level. I can't wait to see what you're about to present, Kate. Give it up. I'm Kate, and our team built HelloGov, which is the easiest way to get your social media followers to call their congressional representatives. Uh, we actually know that calling your representative is one of the best ways to have an impact, and uh, how do we know that personally? I was one of those congressional interns answering the phone. We do listen to you, we write down what you say, and it does matter. So 
HelloGov is a tool for social media influencers that actually lets you, through a very lightweight website, uh, generate a campaign link that you can add to your social posts. Uh, when your followers click through that link, they get everything they need. They find out who their representative is, get them a script that you can help customize, and actually dial the call all right from your tweet or your Facebook post. So uh, we love influencers. They're great. They have this outreach to huge numbers of people. But they, you know, those followers that follow them, they have a many-to-many -many relationship to their representatives. If you're an influencer, you don't know who those people are and can't really give them exact instructions. So that's where we come in. So your influencer can go and set up a, a campaign through our uh, website, and here it is conveniently on mobile as well. And then they can create a custom campaign call script, which is great because uh, you get to have a little bit more of that natural voice than some of uh, the campaign scripts that you get. And then when you click through and post that customized link to your social page, uh, here we have Sean King, whose work I know in uh, using Facebook and Twitter really effectively. We all admired and inspired a lot of this project, you can then uh, track through the number of calls that were made using that unique link. So we're going to do something exciting right now, which is a live demo of, whew, here we go. All right, well, I'm sending this up. Who wants to hear a joke? I want right. to hear a joke. So, knock, knock. knock, knock. Who's there? Obama. Obama who? Oh, by myself. <laughs> Doesn't it feel good to laugh again? Too soon, too soon. <laughs> so here we have Sean King's uh, customized campaign that he's made with HelloGov. Uh, he's asking us to support him in, in uh, supporting the Bridge Act. And let's find out a little bit more about what that is. So I'm actually going to enter in my address back in just because I think it's you know important to know that this works live so it's not just here in San Francisco but actually in Spring Texas so this is my old representative Kevin Brady and I got this really cool script right here that tells me exactly what I need to say so actually let's make the call let's give it a try here we go I have an answering machine, I bet it. Here we go. Put it on speaker. Hi, my name is Kate, and I'm a constituent of Representative Kevin, Kevin Brady in the Woodlands, Texas. I wanted to call to tell you today to uh, actually support the newly bipartisan introduced bill, the Bridge Act, because I think that people who have lived here and there are neighbors and our coworkers and students uh, deserve to be able to have extended visas on the deferral for uh, childhood arrivals and be able to stay and work in the place that they've always called home. So thanks so much for taking down my opinion, and I hope you have a great day. Whoa. All right. <laughs> so, you, you know. could have just read that off of there too, right? Yeah, I, I improved a little bit, but uh, you know, I think that the key points are here, and that's, that's what's great, is that your influencer gets to help influence uh, what you say. So uh, we have a Twitter. We hope you will follow it. Our distribution model so far has actually been to reach out directly to some of these like, major influencers on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, we need your help. Uh, we have a lot of them interested already, but if you could join us, follow us, and then make sure that you retweet and tweet at people who you think are going to be really, really interested in having ways to easily add a campaign call tool to their social media existing programs and posts, definitely help us out. So again, we are HelloGov, the easiest way to add a call Congress tool to social media posts. And I just also want to say, um, Tech does its best when it acts in service of people who are already out there doing the work and uh, making things happen in politics. So I've seen a lot of great stuff today, and I hope that here and beyond that you will absolutely keep building those tools. So thanks so much Ooh. for everything today, guys.